that? How many of you are here specifically today because you want to hear God's voice? It's why you're here. It's why you've come because you want Jesus to speak to you. Can I get some hands raised in the air and say, yeah, that's me? Okay, keep your hands up. Because I want to pray for you, asking that God would speak to you. Father, you see these hands? It's why we've gathered today on a Sunday morning where it's beautiful outside. We could be doing all kinds of other things, but today we've set aside this time to hear your voice. Father, I pray for those who have their hands raised. Lord, that they would submit themselves to you today, that their eyes would be open and that their ears would be softened to hear what it is that the Spirit is speaking to them. God, not my words, but may your words penetrate their hearts and create change in their life. I pray that in the name of Jesus and everyone that wants God to speak to them, say amen. 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 Can you turn to your neighbor this morning and say, God's going to speak to me? Can you do that? God's going to speak to me. I want you to have some expectation this morning that God's going to speak to you this morning. Today, we start a brand new series, and it's called The Commands of Christ. The Commands of Christ. Last week, we celebrated Easter. We celebrated um, Jesus uh, not only being crucified, but more importantly, being raised from the dead, that the stone was rolled away, that Jesus came to bring us life and life to the full. And as we celebrated that last week, many people that come to church, maybe during Christmas and Easter, as they come back to church, a lot of people are wondering, well, what exactly did Jesus teach? What did he have to say, and what are my responsibilities if I give my life to Jesus? And as we find in the New Testament, there are over 50 specific commands that Jesus gives a follower of his. Did you know that? Over 50 specific commands. I know some of you are probably thinking, man, I thought when I gave my life to Jesus that I didn't have to follow any rules, that there weren't any kind of do's and don'ts and those kind of things. Well, Jesus is very specific, and he says this to some of his followers, if you want to come follow me, you have to take up your cross, deny yourself, and then come follow me. Christianity isn't about a bunch of rules, it's about who we follow. And I say that again. It's not a bunch of rules of do's and don'ts. It's all about who we follow. And we follow Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. And today, he's given us specific commands that he wants us to follow. If you were to take all 50 of those commands, and you were kind of break those up into maybe the major commands of Christ, we would discover that there are probably seven major commands that Jesus gave while he was here on earth. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about the seven different commands that Jesus gives his followers. Now, another question comes to mind, I think, for many people, and that is, well, are we really supposed to obey his commands? Isn't it just about love and experience God's freedom and forgiveness? Why do we have to do these commands? Why do I have to do X, Y, or Z? Well, I want to share with you a couple of scriptures this morning. Jesus himself lived an obedient life. Did you know that? Jesus, all-powerful, all-God, and yet 100% man, he submitted himself. He lived an obedient life. Jesus says this about himself. He said, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. Did you catch that? Jesus lived an obedient life. Not only that, But Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient. It says in Philippians 2, verse number 8, this is what Jesus says, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, Jesus was obedient. Jesus humbled himself, even to death on a cross, which is what we looked at last week. And then it says, not only that, 
but he was obedient in the things that he did. We, too, as followers of Jesus, are called to live an obedient life. You, as a follower of Jesus, you're called to live an obedient life. In Matthew chapter 7, words say Jesus, as he's talking, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Those who follow Jesus must be obedient to him even as Jesus was obedient to the Father. In 1 John chapter 5, it says this, For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. This is the love of God. I want to make sure we catch the, the importance of this passage. This is the love of God. Not that we have emotions, not that we get all tingly, not that we just lift up our hands and we feel good, not because Jesus wants to enable you to overcome and get all the wonderful benefits of life. No, Jesus is very specific that when we keep his commandments, that that demonstrates that we love him. It says, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Did you know that? Your faith enables you to overcome the world. Wow, that's a, that's a pretty powerful passage to think through. So as we think about this, Jesus says this. He said in John chapter 14, he says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. This is Jesus, the one who came, who gave his life for us so that we could have life and life to the full. He said this, if you love me, you'll, one translation says this, you'll do what I say. Think about that. Let that sink in just for a second. It's not a matter of just feeling good and getting all the things that you want. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll do what I say. You see, a follower of Jesus obeys the commands that he gives. Even as Jesus was humble, even as Jesus was obedient to the Father, he calls us to do the very same thing. And so as we begin to talk about, over the next several weeks, walking in the ways of Jesus, we need to then be obedient to the commands of Christ. And I would probably wager to say many of us here don't really know what the commands of Christ really are. There were 50 of them, and we're going to identify seven of them. And the word that we're going to discover today the command that Jesus gives is the very first word of the gospel. The very first word of the gospel. And I want to share a few scriptures with that. It says this in Matthew chapter 3, that in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So here's John the Baptist. He's the first on the scene. He's kind of the inauguration of what's to come. And he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then a little bit later, Jesus comes on the scene and he's baptized by John the Baptist. And then it says he is taken into the wilderness and he's tempted. And Jesus comes out in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the very first words out of Jesus' mouth as he comes out of the desert, being tempted full now with the power of the Holy Spirit as he's overcome, the first words out of his mouth are, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus' first words weren't love, weren't you're okay, it's all right. The first words of Jesus weren't peace. The first words that Jesus preaches to those that he came to save was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I want that to soak in just for a moment. Jesus said to repent. He didn't come, first of all, to make you feel good about yourself. 
He didn't come so, first of all, you could be filled with joy. No, the very first thing that he came into the world to say and to communicate was to repent. To repent. And the reason why Jesus says to repent is because the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is coming down to earth. And what the kingdom of heaven is is vastly different than what's on planet earth. The glories and the beauty and the holiness of heaven has now come and is residing with humanity. And Jesus says, in order for you to be able to receive the kingdom of God, to be able to receive the glory and the beauty and the holiness of heaven, in order to receive heaven on earth, you have to first repent. You have to repent. Even the apostles, when Jesus sends out the 12 disciples, he says the very same thing to them, to go, it says. And it says that the disciples, whenever they went out, they proclaimed that people should repent. And so today, I'm here as we talk about the commands of Christ, and I say this to you, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first word of the gospel isn't love or joy or grace or peace. The first word is repent. The first word is repent. But the problem is, is that most people don't know what repent means. They don't understand the definition of repent. You know, I was listening to this pastor uh, talk uh, and um, it, he had a really interesting story that I think really kind of relates to this idea of understanding what repent means. Uh, he was a pastor from England, and he had come from England to Seattle uh, to preach a series of messages. And uh, he was staying at a home of a doctor, an American doctor, and pretty wealthy guy, and uh, the doctor and his wife hosted this uh, British pastor. They hosted him in their home and they fed him great meals and they took him around and carted him wherever they, he wanted to go and just were really, really lovely to him. And he was really amazed with the hospitality that this doctor and his wife had accorded him. And so at the very end of his visits, they're saying their goodbyes and he's with this American doctor and, and he wants to say something about the wife and so he's trying to think of something nice that he can say. And so he looks at the doctor and he says, I, I, I just want to express my gratitude to you for all that, that you've done for me. He says, he says, your wife is the homeliest woman I've ever met. And this British pastor said, and the American doctor looked at me and said, what? And so then he, the, the pastor said, I, I must have not said something right. He said, your wife, she's the homeliest lady I've ever met. And he looks at him and said, well, now, now listen, she's not a movie star, but she's pretty. <laughs> to which... To which he says, oh, what? And then the, the doctor says, well, what do you think homeliness means? And he says, well, he says homeliness means like, 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 like homely, like, like quickly or, 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 uh, yeah, homely, like home-like, like quick-like. And he's like, no, 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 no. In America, homely means like ugly. And he's like, What? And then he began to have a little bit of a conversation with them, and they discovered that the, the British had taken words like homely, or uh, they had words like home-like, and they had dropped the, the K, and it became only, homely, or quick-like became quickly. And so his perspective of homely was a home person, someone who does well at home. That they're great with cooking and cleaning, and, and they're just a great home person. They're warm and that kind of thing. Well, I think it's the same for this understanding that we have of repent. Even in our American culture, we don't understand what repent really means. 
And so I looked up the definition of repent online, and I thought it was really kind of interesting. Repent means to feel sorry or contrite for past, contact, for, for past conduct. In other words, to, to feel sorry for something or to regret or to be like conscience-stricken about a past action or an attitude. It all has to be about sorrowful, being sorrow. But the biblical definition couldn't be further from that definition. It's not about being sorrowful or sorry. The biblical definition of repent is simply this. It says that it means to change one's mind. A transformative change of the hearts. We're not just sorry for our sin. We change our mind. Our heart has a transformation. The, the Greek word, and, and I don't want to belabor this point, but the Greek word is metanoia. And it, how many of you have ever heard of the word of metamorphosis, right? Metamorphosis. Uh, that's two words linked together. Meta means to change, and morphosis means form, so to change the form, right? So when you think about a, a caterpillar that becomes a butterfly, it changes its form and becomes a butterfly. Well, metanoia is the same thing. It means to change one's mind. So to change meta and noia coming from mind or heart, to change your mind, to be transformed, that's what repent means. So when Jesus comes on the scene, he's not saying, repent, feel sorry for all the things that you've done wrong. Be grief-stricken for your past. Regret the things that you've done. You see, Jesus doesn't mean that. And Jesus is very clear, and he's, it's plain. It says, I want you to repent. I want you to change your mind. I want you to have a change of heart. I want you to be transformed. This is the repentance that, that Jesus is talking about here in Scripture. The Bible doesn't mean to just be sorry. Being sorry isn't the same as repentance. Repentance. Feeling guilty about what you've done is not repentance. Don't ever confuse sorrow with repentance. Don't ever confuse the fact that you feel guilty with repentance. Repentance means to, to change your mind, to change your heart. It's not just to feel sorry about something. Sure, you can be sorrowful and you can mourn and weep, but it's more than that. If we limit repentance to just sorrow, we've missed what God has for us to do. We miss heaven coming down and invading our lives. You see, Jesus came and he says, repent, change your mind, change your way of thinking. The way of the world is not the way in which I want you to behave any longer. I want you to change your perspective. He's telling everyone not to feel bad or to feel guilty, but to change their mind. Listen, let, let, me, let me say it this way. Make no mistake, God's command to repent demands a response. So when Jesus came... And he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was asking for a response. When Jesus comes to you in your life, wherever you find yourself today, he comes into your life and he says, repent. I want you to change the way you're thinking. And he's not just saying that so that you can feel guilty about yourself, so that you can feel sorrowful about those bad things that you know you've done in your life. That's not what Jesus is asking for. He's asking for you to do something about it. To change the way that you think. To recognize that what you're doing is wrong. That the way in which you've been walking, the path along which you've been trodden, is the wrong way. It's like going into a city that only has one road and, and taking that journey and heading that way. And, and all of us have been this way. We've walked down the journey and headed to the path of the city called sin. And we've fallen headlong in that direction. 
And Jesus says, listen, I want you to repent, to turn from those ways, to change your perspective. Instead of going one way, you're going to turn around and go another way. That's what repent means. And this is what Jesus asks of us. He wants us to acknowledge that what we're doing isn't working. The things that we're engaged with, the things that we tend to do, he's calling you to action. C.H. Spurgeon Uh, He said it this way, and I want to read this quote that he has. Because there are two ways and modes of repentance. One is a a repentance that brings salvation. And I pray today that many of you here that have never given your life to Jesus, you've never repented, you've never changed your mind about Jesus, changed your mind about the way in which you're going. For those of you that have never done that today, I'm going to give you the opportunity to receive Christ and to change your mind and allow you to turn from your sin and then the power of God will come on and enable you to walk out the power that he has for you. And that's salvation, repentance unto salvation. But there's another repentance that's probably more appropriate for many of you that are here today that have already given your life to Jesus. And there's an ongoing repentance that we have, that we live in our life. And C.H. Spurgeon, one of my favorite preachers, he says this. He says, I trust that sorrowful repentance still exists, though I've not heard about it much lately. People seem to jump into faith very quickly nowadays. I hope my old friend repentance isn't dead. I am desperately in love with repentance. It seems to me to be the sister, the twin sister of faith. I don't understand much about dry-eyed faith. I know that I came to Christ by the way of the weeping cross. When I came to Calvary by faith, it was with great weeping and supplication, confessing my transgressions and desiring to find salvation in Jesus and in Jesus alone. See, when Spurgeon became a believer, he changed his mind. He wasn't doing what he wanted to do. He began to follow Jesus. He changed his mind. And it was an attitude that he had throughout his life. And so the question I have for many of us today Are you walking in repentance? Not just pray that prayer 10 years ago or 5 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Are you living a life in such a way that you recognize, oh God, without you, I'm a sinner. And the things that I do that are contrary to the ways of heaven, contrary to the kingdom of heaven, I have not only deep remorse and sorrow for, but I change my mind about it. I confess those things and walk a different way. You see, Paul had this same issue. He was an apostle and he was overseeing many different churches throughout the Middle East. And one of the churches at Corinth specifically had grown up and become kind of this metropolitan church. The problem with this church is that they, they began to have problems and issues and fighting and Paul begins to write, with, write to them and say, listen, you need to repent. What was going on in the church at Corinth? A number of different issues. Maybe a pastor's worst nightmare. I mean, they were off and they were arguing with one another. They were talking about whose leader they would following, whose pastor was better than another, which pastor could speak better than another, who had the anointing and who didn't. And Paul was like, who are you following? Are you following men or are you following Jesus? And I think we can find that in the church today. Well, that pastor, he didn't quite bring it. That pastor, well, I don't know about him. He didn't quite say things the way I would say them. We say those same things. And Paul begins to write to them and says, you need to change your mind. That's not the kingdom of heaven. And it continues to go, they they were gossiping one with the other. Did you hear what that pastor did? Did you see what that guy did? Did you see them walk into that room? Did you see them go over there? They were hanging out with those people over there. Can you believe they were doing that? You get a look at her family. Man, they have, they are all messed up over there. They're gossiping one another, backbiting, yelling and screaming. Not only that, but they're, they're, within the church itself, there's sexual immorality. People are engaging in sex outside of marriage, and, and they think it's okay. No one sees, no one knows, doesn't matter. If I can just come to church on Sunday, it's all right. And Paul says in 
Jesus says, and today I'm saying, repent. Repent. Change your mind. If you're gossiping, engaging in sex outside of marriage, if you're doing those things that are tearing down others, that's not the kingdom of heaven. That's the kingdom of the world. And Jesus has come specifically into our world to destroy that way of thinking and living. Not only that, the church at Corinth, they were suing each other. They were so at odds with one another. There was difficulty. And Paul begins to write to them, and this is what he has to say. He says, I'm not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you Though I was very sorry at first, for I know that it was painful to you for a little while. Now I am glad I sent it, not because it hurt you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have. Did you catch that? It's the kind of sorrow that God wants his people to have, so you were not harmed by us in any way. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, did you catch that? Worldly sorrow that lacks repentance results in spiritual death. See, you can be sorry about the things that you're doing, maybe behind closed doors, those things that you don't think anyone can see, but I guarantee you it will lead to spiritual death. That's what Paul has to say here. It's that serious. This isn't the feel-good message of the year, is it? But it's something that we have to look at. And as a pastor, man, it's, it's incumbent upon me to make sure that we preach the whole counsel of God's Word. And it's a message sometimes that's, that's not easy to preach. But I want to say this to some of you that are engaged in practices that you know are wrong. I'm preaching to you and speaking to you and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I implore you to please turn away from the sin that you're engaged with. As you're headed down the wrong path, I say to you, turn around, change your mind and walk towards God. He'll give you the power and the authority to overcome in your life. But first, you have to change your mind. I say that this morning. Some of you may be thinking about certain things that you've been engaged in, maybe in the last week or the last two weeks. And today, I don't want you to feel sorry about those things. I don't want you to feel guilty about those things. I don't want you to even get a hard heart about what I'm speaking to you. I want you simply to repent, to change your mind, to have a heart transformation. And the only way in which that will come is if you identify and recognize and confess God, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me. When we engage in that kind of behavior, this is what the Bible says. When you humble yourself, when you come into God's presence and you humble yourself and you say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I've done this and this and this. God doesn't come and beat you up. He doesn't come and say, well, you are a dirty, rotten sinner and stay that way. This is not how God treats his people. This is not how God treats those that are wanting to become part of his family. How God treats you is simply this. He says, if we humble ourselves, that God at the right time will lift you up. But he won't lift you up until you bow your knee and your head to him. Until you begin to repent, God can't lift you up. God's not going to allow you to overcome in areas of your life if you don't repent and turn to him. Oh, you might think things are going okay in your life, but at the end of the day, if you're not giving your life to Christ, if you're not bending your knee in repentance and saying, God, have mercy on me, then he's not going to lift you up. And God longs for you. 
He longs to be gracious to you. Did you know that? He doesn't want you to be sorrowful that will lead to spiritual death. He wants you to have a change of heart. He wants you to repent and turn to him. Would you do that this morning? Would you turn from your ways that you know that maybe you're feeling guilty and sorrowful about? And today, would you change your mind? It says in Romans uh, chapter 2, it says that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Don't you understand this? Paul is talking to the church at Rome. He says, don't you understand? It's God's kindness that leads you to repentance. He loves you so much. He's kind to you. He's gracious to you. He extends every mercy into your hand. But your response is simply this. God, have mercy on me. I humble myself and turn from my sin. I change my way. And as you do that, God doesn't leave you by yourself. He doesn't want you just to kind of pull you up by your bootstraps and you can kind of make and figure out how to do this repentance thing. No. It says that Christ gives you the power to overcome. For those that are in Christ are a new creature. Old things are past. And behold, all things are new. See, God gives you the power to overcome, to become new in your life. He's the one that creates a transformation in your life. But the first step is admitting and confessing and changing your mind. So would you bow your heads with me this morning as I offer a challenge to every single one of you that are here. As I've done my best to try to lay out this first command of Christ to repent, there are those of you here in this room who are far from God, who have, have engaged in sinful behavior, who have done things that you know are wrong and today God is kindly and gently trying to lead you back to himself because you're the child that he loves. He wants you to experience the kingdom of heaven and the joys that come with his life. But as you continue to hold on to that sin, you can't experience his grace and his goodness and his mercy and his power. You see, if you don't receive the first word of the gospel, you can't receive the rest of it. And so today I would ask, as we keep our eyes closed and our head bows, if that's you today, I want to pray for you. If you found yourself in a situation where you've, you've been disobedient in areas of your life and you want to confess those things, you want to change them, I want you to lift your hand just right now. Just lift your hand all over here. Don't be shy. Be bold. Yeah, I want to pray for you. I see these hands all over. God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, oh God, I pray that those that are here today, God, that they would turn from their sin, that they would follow you and walk with you, God, that you would give them the power and the authority by your spirit and by your presence to overcome in their lives. They would recognize the grace and the joy and the peace that you have for them, that even today as they change their mind, as they begin to walk a new path, that God, you would meet them right where they are and surround them with love and joy and grace. God, I pray, fill them, fill them with your presence, oh God. May they become justified because of what you have done on the cross, because your blood was poured out for us, and it washes us whiter than snow. I thank you, O oh God, that right now, even as they're confessing their sins to you, that you are removing their sins as far as the east is from the west, that you've blotted out their sins, that you remember it no more, and that today begins a new day and a new slate and a new chapter in their lives. God, I thank you that that's the power of the gospel. Today, oh God, I thank you for redemption that's taking place in the hearts and minds and lives of those that have their hands lifted up today. God, I pray, thank you for them and bless them in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. 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 I want to...